This episode was made possible by our generous patrons. Welcome to episode 165 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. All right, coming to you live from our burrow inside the island of misfit toys, are you ready mm-hmm. to talk about the social pressure to conform in society, James? <laughs> yeah. It's crazy because like, I feel like it, this, is a, this is something I watched a lot growing up. And didn't really like I was never analyzing it in in this way, but like there's a lot about, um, yeah, conformity. But then there's also like individualism stuff in here Mm -hmm. as well, I would say. Right. Like there's there's definitely some messages of like be your own person and go against the grain. Yeah, it's going against the grain of conformity. You know, like the, the, the social pressure to conform isn't necessarily, you know, treated as like right and just um it also depends on what version we're talking about so we should go ahead and mention we are covering multiple versions of the story um starting with the very first uh children's book um written for montgomery ward by robert may 1939 is the original genesis of this story um it was later adapted into a 1947 i believe uh song Mm -hmm. Um, which then was followed by a 1948 animated short and then a 1964 stop-motion animation film, which is going to be the last thing we're going to talk about, Rankin-Bass production, which is a very well-known stop-motion thing. That's what we're going to cover in this episode. Yeah, I mean, going over the source material for this stuff, um, that Rankin-Bass one has some additions, to say the least. Yeah, it sure does. and, and, And some of them are solid, you know, some of them are cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to talk about in every version. Um, We're going to basically work through our way chronologically, I think, uh, try and provide some background information about each version. But yeah, this is our Christmas episode, you know, our holiday special. So happy holidays to everybody. Um, Hopefully you're having a good one out there, even though it's been uh, a wild year. Um, You know, it's it's a time of year that I typically enjoy. Um, This year has been a little more challenging than others, but Doing this kind of stuff uh, helps out a little bit, so hopefully this episode will uh, will help you out too. Yeah, I, I you know, of course, there's so much I've taken for granted before 2020, but um, it, it's always interesting to think like I, I don't realize that like society, people, um, all of these things are, are what get me into the holiday spirit because it's felt weird this year, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it does, hasn't. It's felt like almost like I've been like forcing myself into the holiday spirit, but. You know, some of these nostalgic things and, and talking with family and all that kind of stuff helps. But it's just uh, what a weird year. We're going to look back. I just like, keep thinking about how it's going to look in 20 years when we look back and we're like the year that we all stayed inside. Yeah, I, I'm i really curious to see, you know, 10 years from now what it'll be like to look back at this year. At least we have all these time capsules, right? These episodes we did, um, which we'll, we'll talk more about this next week when we get to our annual year in review recap episode uh our last looks episode which is going to be our final episode for 2020 um but for now i think let's focus on the task at hand which is covering rudolph um i i I guess i'll talk a little bit about robert may um the man who who invented rudolph um he is uh he grew up in an affluent secular jewish home in new york his parents were hard hit by the great depression and uh, eventually he moved to Chicago and got, pay- got a job um, as the in-house advertising copywriter for Montgomery Ward, which leads us to what happened. <laughs> so essentially his boss came to him in, um, I think it was 1939, and said that Montgomery Ward wanted to put out a children's book. They had been putting out these um, coloring books, I think, that were, that were kind of a hit, and they wanted to put out a children's book. And so they said, come up with something. <laughs> and he had wanted to be a novelist, but had ended up having to take this job as, as an, uh, you know, just an ad copy person. So he went home and was thinking about it and was trying to figure out what he was going to do. And I saw a little, uh, we like to talk about story seeds here a little bit. So I saw this little bit, which, which made, me, made me happy. So while May was pondering how best to craft a Christmas story about a reindeer, 
While staring out of his office window in downtown Chicago, a thick fog from Lake Michigan blocked his view, giving him a flash of inspiration. Suddenly I had it, he recalled. A nose, a bright red nose that would shine through fog like a spotlight. So literally just looking out your window, trying to come up with something, and the fog rolls in, and you, you have the idea that would you know, change culture in many ways. I mean, Rudolph is massive. This is like one of the biggest Christmas figures there is. Absolutely. I feel like, I mean, Rudolph is synonymous, you know, with Christmas at this point. And um, this this is one of those stories that, you know, being someone who grew up in like the 90s and 2000s, this, this story, I know it was written in the 30s, but it feels like it's as old as time. It feels like mm-hmm. it's like ancient writing to right, me. Right, right, yeah, yeah. It almost feels like it's yeah, it's um, as old as Santa or something, you know, like like old right. pagan, but it's not. It's you not. know, invented by this guy in, in the thirties. Um, so in, and an ad man at that. So it was very much like man, motivated yeah. by capitalism and and like uh, specifically like uh, we'll get to it, but like the the uh, famous Rankin Bass version is like sponsored by GE, and it was like this whole this whole like marketing thing as well. Mm, I didn't know that. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, he, he took this idea to his boss and his boss was quoted as saying, can't you come up with anything better <laughs> when he showed it to him? <laughs> awesome. And he, he had to like stick to his guns and be like, no, this, this, this is going to be good. This is going to be a hit. I promise you, um, mm-hmm. had to convince him to do it. So months, uh, he, his boss, his boss ended up giving him the okay. And he approached, uh, 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 someone named Denver, uh, Gillen to do illustrations for it. I think this was another person at the company or maybe a friend of his, um, months into the project, however, his wife would die of cancer, leaving him uh, as a widowed single father. Um, he, a lot of people who who've talked about this story note that like loneliness, there's a certain sort of like melancholy that pervades the story, and I would agree with that. I mean, like some of the early you know images you see when you're reading about Rudolph being ostracized by the other reindeer is of uh, Rudolph just crying. Like, there's just reindeer just weeping. Um, very anthropomorphized, yeah. um, often walking around on two two legs, like bipedal. Um, mm-hmm. Really interesting. Like, some of the art, you know, is, is fascinating in that it's, like, clearly situating Rudolph as more of a human than a reindeer to me. Well, I mean, you got to think like in the in the original story, he's like getting tucked into bed and like like yeah. waiting for Santa and has a stocking and all that kind of thing, right? Right. So, I mean, let's talk about that original story, right? Like he can't play in the reindeer games. That's that's consistent with the you know the story that we we know from later versions. Um, but then, yeah, he's he's getting tucked into bed at his parents' house. He's a young reindeer. He's got this glowing nose. He goes to bed. Santa goes out with his reindeer. Like we like flash over to Santa. He takes the reindeer out on a sleigh. Is having trouble because it's really dark, dark of night. You know, like black. Can't see anything. Stumbles into Rudolph's room, sees his glowing nose, and is like, "Yes, this is what I've always needed. Um, you're gonna come with me and lead my sleigh tonight." And Rudolph like gets up, writes a letter to his mom, <laughs> like, "Hey, mm-hmm. heading out. <laughs> well, you know, don't worry about me." Um, and then, uh, yeah, he, he just takes over the sleigh. Uh, they're able to complete their task, deliver the toys, comes back and all the reindeer that had been shitty to him now all of a sudden wanted to be his friend. This reminds me a little bit of like, uh, what was it? Snow White we talked about? No, not Snow White. Uh, Cinderella, where the, the stepsisters, um, ha- after being all shitty are now like, Hey, we're cool. Right. And they get to come into the kingdom. And, um, that's yeah. kind of how these like shitty reindeer are like. Uh, I guess they just get forgiven. I, 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 in all of these versions, I'm like, they're they're all lucky that Rudolph doesn't want revenge, right? <laughs> he just wants to be yeah. part of society. He's like, I won't use my nose for good unless these people are condemned to reindeer hell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he doesn't do that, though. Um, but let's go back to real life. So that's that's the version of this, the original version of this tale with, with a little more nuance. It's actually worth reading. It's a quick read. You can go on to, I think it's like an NPR article about it where you can play a recording of, I believe it's Robert May's sister reading the original story to you. So it's cool. And you can see the original art. It's really interesting. I feel like the story isn't the same unless it has like the fun lyricism and like the the sort of, 
rhyming scheme that it has. And I think that that's why the, mm. I, that's part of why this is so massive. That's a great point. So so it's basically a poem. Um, it is uh, it is written in rhyming couplets that are anapestic tetrameter. For those of you who might be interested in that sort of thing. Um, anapests are two uh, unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable. Uh, so that's the, the form of the metrical foot. And then you have uh, four metrical feet together as a tetrameter um, versus like the uh, the famous iambic pentameter, which is what like Shakespeare would use, which is unstressed, stressed, uh, foot, mm-hmm. uh, metrical foot, five of them together, pentameter. So that's generally how it goes. I think there is some variation. I was trying to scan it, but it's been a long time since I've scanned a poem. So um, I kind of like fell off of it. Um, but it, it, it's... Um, it's metrical in a way that that works, and um, I, I was also reading that this formation, this anapestic tetrameter, is very popular in Dr. Seuss. So it might seem mm-hmm. familiar in that way. It's a very, it's, I feel like it's a very children rhyme kind of formation. Yeah, and some of the ways that that the rhymes were coming together were were playful and sort of like you know just come along with it. Like it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. work perfectly, but like just yeah, play. You get some slant rhymes at times. Yeah. Right. And I I think it, you know, it works for the story and it makes it sort of memorable and it makes it also like uh, more human and personal. And and I don't know, something about it being in this story. I don't know. It just works for me. I do think you get a couple of kind of weird rhymes just to fit the rhyme scheme. And it seemed like. Yeah, for sure. For sure. (laughs) Having trouble. Like one uh, one I wrote down by you last night's journey was actually bossed. Without you, I'm certain we'd all have been lost. <laughs> Which, like, okay, he needed to line something with lost. Bossed? <laughs> like, what is that? Is that a saying I'm unfamiliar with? By you, last night's journey was actually bossed. <laughs> I don't um, know. There's yeah. a couple of these kind of kind of awkwardy ones, and it feels like they're, he was... I, I don't know that he had the talent that, say, a Dr. Seuss had. Although Dr. Seuss uh, could just invent his own words, so that probably helped him hit those rhyme schemes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I agree with you. It kind of does feel like when you're saying it's like an ad man who was told by his boss and he's like taking us. It, it feel, also feels like it's like it hit at the perfect time in the perfect way. And mm-hmm. it, because this isn't a perfect children's story song, I would say, like as we're as we're seeing, although or maybe it's not of the quality of something like Dr. Seuss, like you. like Yeah. You mentioned. I don't know. Yeah, maybe not. But um, it certainly, you know, was popular, which we'll get into. So just one real quick other thing. I, I, I just... <laughs> At one point in the in the poem, Santa says, your wonderful forehead may yet pave the way. And then he goes on yeah. to con- repeatedly call it his forehead because he, he's being polite and not calling it his nose, which it is. And, and I immediately wrote down, bitch, you can see my nose. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, you can just I, see my forehead. <laughs> I, I feel like, I, I honestly, like, when that first popped up, I thought that he was, again, needing something to rhyme or something. He needed to rhyme something with forehead or he needed to use uh-huh. forehead to rhyme with something else or something. But yeah, no, but it comes up a couple more times where it's like erm forehead because he like forehead. doesn't want to say nose. So actually, I actually know what this might have been. I read like after okay. the fact I was reading something about it um, in the in the era, the 30s. Um, they were really concerned about the red nose because um, the red nose was was heavily tied to alcoholics because they would get a red nose mm. if you if you like abused alcohol. And it was a big problem of the time. And so. They didn't want to necessarily have that association, so I think it was kind of controversial, and I think they wanted him to change it, but then he re- he resisted. But for that reason, whereas now, like no one really thinks of alcoholics and red noses, that's just not really a thing people talk about anymore. But it was at the time. So Robert May also considered naming the reindeer Rollo or Reginald before deciding upon Rudolph. So you know, an alternate world maybe would have had Rollo the red nosed reindeer, reindeer, Reginald the red nosed reindeer. Didn't, doesn't Both. seem to quite have the same feel, but <laughs> yeah. Knows? Wonder why Rolo. I've never heard of Rolo. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so after he convinces boss and, and he and he goes through all this, his wife dies. Um, it ends up being a hit, and um, Montgomery Ward ends up printing and distributing two million copies that year alone of his of his story. Um, wow. However, he's still living on a copywriter's salary and in debt for his medical bills because he does not own the rights to this story. Oh, brutal. Yeah. That sucks. Um, However, um, later on, after World War II ended, Montgomery Ward's CEO gave May the rights back 
to Rudolph or granted him the rights to Rudolph. But it's unclear why from everything I was seeing. Like some people said that like maybe it was because he felt like he should be able to make money off of this thing. But other people were saying that like at the time Montgomery Ward's brass didn't think that it was going to be profitable anymore. So they wanted to, they just got rid of it. I don't know. So it's unclear on whether or not it was like an altruistic thing or not. But maybe the spirit of Christmas came over him. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another funny thing or interesting thing. His brother-in-law was a, was an aspiring songwriter. So this is the brother of his deceased wife, right? Um, his brother-in-law was a uh, aspiring songwriter, and he talked him into writing a song about Rudolph, which he would then uh, he which he wrote, and then he would sell to Gene Autry, who who wrote the famous version um, that would go on to sell twenty five million copies. And then itself would lead to the Rankin Bass animated film. Wow. So kind of kept it Wild. in family, which is cool. Yeah. So, I mean, if he sold the rights to the song, hopefully he made a decent amount when he sold it to uh, Autry. I don't know. I don't have all the details about how, like, the money that was exchanged or what have you. Um, but yeah, I assume if he had the rights back at some point. He had to start getting some money for this, but it sounds like it took a little while, and he was actually because he continued had to, he had to continue his work and his job. Like he, this is, it wasn't like he it's made bank. There's, and got there's to quit. a this this literally sounds like a biopic. Like this sounds like a biopic that comes out in a couple of years where yeah, it's dude. like, let's get on it. Let's start pinning that script. Yeah, I'm not a huge <laughs> biopic guy, but yeah, I mean, somebody will run with it. That's fucking. That's money in the bank, man. You put it out Christmas time. Story yeah. of Rudolph. Every year it pops back up. There you go. Give me, you can make it work. Um, so that's the story behind this version. Now this eventually led to the initial adaptation. The 1948 short was uh, by someone named Max Flesher. Um, it is an eight minute interpretation of the poem. And it actually comes out before Gene Autry's 1949 song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So it doesn't have any connection to it. The version that we saw, the one that I was able to see, does have some of the song in there, but that was a re-release that came out later where they added it to it. Originally, it did not have the song in there, um, but because it was so popular, they added it. Also, the original version had Montgomery Ward like all over it because it was an advertisement for Montgomery Ward, which wow. they later removed. I don't know if you'll believe this, but when, when I watched that animated version, that, that eight-minute animated version, mm -hmm. I, I'm more familiar with that version than with the Rankin-Bass version. You know the only reason I, I can believe how. this is because my wife is the same way. She when she saw it, she was like, "This is the one I've seen." I, she didn't even think she'd ever seen the other one. Yeah, well, I've seen. I know that I've seen both, but I don't know if I had a VHS. I don't know if I had like I don't know what it was. TBS man or whatever it was. Like it was on every year at Christmas. Like I don't know. I no, saw it on this, TV for the, sure. This one, like the short one, the eight minute one. Oh no no, is the, what I'm talking the about. The other one, stop motion. So you're saying you don't know how you saw this one? Yeah. I don't know how, but this is the one that I'm much more familiar with. Like when he's sitting there and he's like, like pushing the reindeer through and he's like on Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer. Mm -hmm. And he's like that, that was so like, that was such a, uh, like a shifting of my brain to bring me back mm -hmm. to some young age of when I saw that a million times. Um, yeah. I felt that way watching the, the stop motion. But I do also remember like Christmas, Christmas Eve, I, that one would always, the uh, Rankin Bass one would always be on TV. So I definitely yeah. saw both and I was familiar with both. Um, so this this original animated version uh, is way more faithful to the poem. Like it's basically right out of the poem. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lines right out of the poem. You have the anthropomorphic bipedal reindeer walking around. There's like a reindeer town, you know, like yeah. like city almost. Like there's like architecture and newspapers and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. it's um, it's really just a different feel <laughs> than what we get what we get with the Rankin Bass production, which is, I feel like a lot more whimsical and, and sort of uh, geared towards children in some ways, but in other ways we can talk about um, quite yeah. mature, <laughs> it seems to me. Yeah. So one last thing to get to before we talk about the animated version is the Gene Autry song. So he was known as the singing cowboy and he had, he had a Christmas record where he put this out. Um, he added it. The song was suggested as a B-side um, for, for the record, and Autry at first rejected the song, but his wife convinced him to use it. Um, however, as you can imagine, hugely popular, hit number one in 1949 on the U.S. charts, 
Um, it also holds the distinction of being the only chop chart-topping hit to fall completely off the chart after reaching number one. The official date of its number one status was the week ending in January 7th, 1950, making it the first number one song of the 1950s. So it lasted one week, came out came out on Christmas, lasted one week on the charts, and then was gone because Christmas was over. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, yeah. I guess it would probably would not ever get back up to number one, but it definitely got popular again every year. You know, people brought it back up. Well, you've set me up because... so. Autrius Recordings sold 1.75 million copies in its first Christmas season, and 1.5 million following in the following year. In 1969, he was awarded the gold disc for sales of 7 million, which was Columbia's highest-selling record at the time. It eventually sold a total of 12.5 million. Cover versions included, sales exceed 150 million copies sold, second only to Bing Crosby's White Christmas. In December of 2018... Autry's original version entered the Billboard Hot 100 at 36. Nearly 70 years after it first charted, it climbed to number 27 the week ending in December 22nd of 2018 and peaked at number 16 the week ending of January 5th, 2019. Wow. Recent. (laughs) I don't know what was going on where all of a sudden it came back, but it came back. (laughs) That's crazy. I don't know. That was that year. Yeah. I wonder wonder what the statistics are on like which there's there's got to be like one you know like mariah's care Mar- mariah carey is all i want for christmas like takes off one year and then the next year it's a different one because of people's mm. taste or something i don't know because they all they all get popular again obviously mm-hmm. so in 1964 burl eyes would record the song for the soundtrack of the holiday special we're about to talk about um rudolph the red nose reindeer and that itself was also very popular um that album reaching uh the top two billboard top 200 and and selling lots of copies as well so um many versions of this story have gone on to do well um but it seems like really the one that is the the best known um is the autry version although i will say i think the burl ives one from the animated feature is the one i had heard the most after going back and listening to them both for this episode that was the one i was more Mm -hmm. familiar with they're pretty similar though yeah yeah pretty similar i i I couldn't tell you which one I was more familiar with. I was I did watch like a, a video performance of Autry singing the song in sort of like a really? casual way and sort of like engaging with the audience while he was doing it. Mm-hmm. And um, I was kind of surprised that he was he I was I was always imagining more. I always imagine all these singers to be like more like Frank Sinatra. And I know this is before <laughs> Sinatra, but like when he was yeah. when he was like a cowboy, I was like, whoa, wasn't expecting a cowboy. Yeah, singing cowboy. So I, I just want to ask you before we move on to to the animated movie what was your experience like what what was your takeaways from reading this version of rudolph and and did it like live up to subvert your expectations or 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 what i think that i was surprised at how familiar i was with the story itself i really like the art that goes along with it like i think that that sort of like oh it's almost like minimalistic art yeah it was Uh, very it was uh it almost looked like it was drawn in color pencils or something like it was very simple yeah yeah but But like also cool I really like the art. And then, um, yeah, the story, I, like I said, I've talked about the rhyming scheme. And I think, you know, you can be the kind, I feel like there are people that, that don't like this, like this kind of like rhyming, you know, people who probably don't like poetry. And I think that at some points this, that he kind of stretches what, what should fit in, into some of these rhymes. Um, but it's like a, it's like a children's, like be yourself kind of story. So you can just go along with it and and like I, the legacy i think I, I just don't know this is this we were just talking about this recently but like what's it like if if a story like this comes out today and i know like everything that's come after it has built on rudolph the red-nosed reindeer yeah but, like what is it like to drop a kill children's book right now that's like this um and like what kind of impact it would have oh uh, man it's just a different world you know you got so much competition there's so many children's books coming out all the time and yeah it's impossible to say because you're living in a world where like our world is built on Rudolph in many ways. Our Christmas stories yeah. are built on Rudolph, you know. So, yeah, it's hard hard to say, but it it hit at the right time. Right, and I think you definitely should appreciate. It. That's why you have to put yourself in the shoes of a, somebody in that time period. Like we I, we appreciate yeah. it because it's still great even today, even with the people who've done done things similar, other Christmas stories. It might not be your favorite anymore, but it has that legacy because it yeah. came out when it did and it became so popular. That, like, you just can't touch it. Let's talk a little bit about the themes that are going on in the story, right? Like, um, it is about this, 
like in, in every version, it's about Rudolph being born different and being ostracized for being different. And then he's sort of discovered by Santa or he, sh- he shows himself, he like, you know, proves himself in some way to Santa who then decides to give him a job. And once he's given this job, which is supposed to be the like height of whatever rain, you know, anything a reindeer could ever dream to do, which is lead Santa's sleigh. He is then beloved by society. So the themes there are interesting because it does seem like this is bad. Like we're supposed to feel sorry for Rudolph and the forces that raid against him, I don't think are positive. Yet the messaging seems to imply that the way to succeed is to conform or to find a way to make what makes you unique have a use in society. You know what I mean? Like it's right. it's all about the way that you're useful in the society you're in. And maybe you know we're reading too much into it because it's a children's story, but that's also what we do here. So, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, like you said, I, I think it could be you know, like you said, like there there is maybe a messaging in a different children's story where it's like be yourself and don't don't sort of like um, see your success as how everyone else thinks you're doing. Whereas in this story, it's very much like Rudolph sees his level of success based on how everyone is perceiving him at the end of the story mm-hmm. whether it's he's he hasn't necessarily conformed but he's created like a little niche area for himself to where they're now happy and then he now fits within that conformity he's the new conformity and so yeah, like he, 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 the thing that made him unusual and, and was initially his shame was it, it has found to be useful by society and therefore now right. he's he's to be envied um yeah yeah. So I mean the the follow-up question is like, well, what if what if his nose was never found to be useful? How do how should we feel about Rudolph then? You know? Yeah. Which is is where I, my mind always goes, but um we can touch on this more as we go because we're about to talk about the Rankin Bass production, which um you did all the research for, so I'm curious to know what you're able to discover, which by the way, this isn't the first Rankin Bass thing we've done. We did a bonus episode about a Rankin Bass production, right? Yeah, we covered Return of the King on a bonus episode. It's Return of the mm-hmm. King animated done by uh, by uh, Rankin Bass, which kind of followed Ralph Bakshi's weird adaptation of Lord of the Rings, which we also yeah. covered in a bonus episode. Yeah. And Return of the King is a weird movie too so we, we talked yeah. about both of those in bonus episodes and and, and the hobbit they they, they yeah. did we haven't covered that one yet but yeah we haven't covered it yet but they did a, an anime this is before return of the king or the lord of the rings uh that ralph bakshi did in 1977 they did a they did a version of tolkien's the hobbit um which i, which I don't know that well, i've ever seen I'm on record and i know that you love it yeah yeah, yeah. could be cool to cover that at some point they also are yeah a massive influence to a lot of things and honestly like the filmmaker isn't really that notable for rudolph the red nose ranger so i am going to talk more about rankin bass than i am um the filmmaker themselves rankin bass is very well known for stop motion animation traditional animation um huge influences that would you know create ripples that would become waves that would continue on until today really um i have i have a few things here that i'll read about uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, this production of it, and then also into Rankin Bass. So, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is a 1964 Christmas stop motion animation animated television special. It first aired Sunday, December 6, 1964, on NBC Television Network in the United States, and was sponsored by General Electric under the umbrella title of the General Electric Fantasy Hour. And in this version, there is an American actor who kind of was the uh, was the core of this adaptation. It's Burl Ives uh, in the role of the Sam the Snowman, uh, the narrator and original oh, yeah. orchestral. Sam the Snowman was something. Yeah, and the, the or- and an original orchestral score was composed by Marx, who um, was May's brother-in-law, who you mentioned. Mm-hmm. So very interesting. The, 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 you know, the lines are, are blurring there between like, it's staying in the family, as you said. Rudolph became one of the most popular, longest-running Christmas specials in television history. It remained with NBC until around 1972 when it moved to CBS. In 2019, for its 55th anniversary, the special was also aired on Freeform as part of its 25 Days of Christmas franchise, although it will continue to air on CBS under a separate license with Universal. Um, The special contains seven original songs, 
1965, a new song was filmed in Animagic to replace We're a Couple of Misfits titled Fame and Fortune. So they like sort of they've been changing it over time, which is something else that I interesting. Realized. I wonder what version I saw because I don't remember. I, uh, my, I, don't our, remember I think the version we watched had We're a Couple of Misfits in it. So an older version, potentially. OK, I'm um, not sure. Though. Yeah, you're right. Because, I, yeah, I do remember that song now that you think about it. Yeah, interesting. The success of Rudolph led to numerous other Christmas specials. The first was The Cricket on the Hearth with a live action prologue by Danny Thomas and animation by TCJ in 1967, followed by the Thanksgiving special The Mouse on the Mayflower, told by Tennessee Ernie Ford and animated by Toei Animation. Now, this is bringing me to a whole other thing, a whole other facet of my life. Toei Animation is an animation studio that's been working in Japan for ever for like since the 60s probably since before that and the reason i bring that up is all the animation um, not all a lot of the animation that's done in in rankin basses in their studios some of it's done in ontario in ottawa canada but also japanese animation studios worked on things so let me read this here rankin basses traditionally sell animated works were done at crawley films in ottawa Ontario, Canada, and later the other Japanese animation studios, Toei Animation, TCJ, and Mushi Production. And from the 1970s to the early 80s, the others were animated by another of Tokyo's animation studios, Topcraft, which was formed in 1971 as an offshoot of Toei Animation. Many Topcraft staffers, include, including the studio's founder, Toru Hara, who was credited as an animation supervisor in some of Rankin Bass's specials, would go on to join its successor, Studio Ghibli, and work on Hayao Miyazaki's feature films, including Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind and My Neighbor Totoro. Wow. Wow. It all connects together. How about that? It all comes together. And animation and stop motion animation, I have a passion for it. I'm not, I'm not, that's not the kind of artist I consider myself. I'm not, I can't draw and I can't, maybe, you know, claymation or, or like sort of stop motion at some point, but um, I really respect that as a, as a medium unto itself. And, and like just knowing the lineage of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the stop motion goes on to create so many others and continue the success of animation studios across the world in Canada and Japan, um, and which would eventually lead to some of the more massive studios in Japan creating some of the anime that people consume. And, and, you know, I Mm. think that's awesome. There's a lot of uh, Christmas specials and, and other specials that would follow too, that I felt like followed the blueprint of this Mm -hmm. to try with different levels of success to, to get the sort of similar popularity thinking of like the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Definitely. Or I think there's like a frosty, the snowman, uh stop motion the, no one, well two. frosty the snowman the the animated one that i'm very familiar with that came out in the 60s was also rankin bass it was just their their traditional animation department instead of it being stop motion oh it wasn't stop motion see i don't even remember but yeah 19 1969 frosty the snowman was rankin bass interesting so yeah i mean they're, they're all over this this uh holiday special game <laughs> well they yeah they had a few i mean I, there's a there's a massive list i didn't i didn't bother copying them down but it's like rudolph does this rudolph goes to the island of toys is Rudolph like right. uh, Rudolph Shiny New Year, sequels, Jack right? Frost, Frosty's Winter Wonderland. There's Rudolph these... out for blood. Yeah, so they, they continue Should doing <laughs> the holiday thing for a while. I don't think any had the successes as these, but you know, I mean, this this movie's legacy. Right. Let's talk about that. I mean, it's it's alongside like you mentioned, Charlie Brown Christmas. Um, it's a Wonderful Life. Some of these Christmas movies that go down as the ones that everybody watches or used to watch every year. This was in that. You know, this made that list and. Um, I do really enjoy a lot of the changes they made to the story. It kind of added more of a fantasy mm-hmm. element to it in some cases, like other yeah, creatures. Yeah, there's castles and yeah. monsters. And yeah, I mean, it's, it has a real fantasy feel for it, for sure. And and I think a young Luke watching it, you know, I think that really spoke to me. Because I, I had a fond place for this. And, and, and re-watching it this time, I realized that it, it has been a very long time since I've seen this. So much so that I didn't remember a lot of it. It was one of those things. It was like once I saw it, it activated memories that I didn't even know I had. And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do remember this. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. The parts that I remembered more that are more traditional reindeer, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer parts, were some of the things that I was least interested in. When they transitioned to be like, now we're going to go on this adventure. I was like, oh, shit, I don't remember this very well. And this is cool. We're going to like find an abominable snowman and or at least confront it, not find it um and this the yeah abominable snow monster snow monster (laughs) of the north 
<laughs> yeah, Bumble, as as he's called by Yukon, uh, which he was quite a character. Um, should we go over? I don't know if we should go over the plot to this or not. Um, I feel like people mostly know it, but like I didn't remember a lot of it either, so it could be worth it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'll read a uh, synopsis. I do have something here. I'll probably go through, maybe it'll do like half and half. It's kind of long, so I just wanted to okay, like, yeah, read it a little quickly. But I do have uh, a couple other things I want to touch on. When this film came out um, in 1964, the technology of using the articulating armatures inside the figures to sort of get the stop motion was considered amazing and like all this and people were like all, they couldn't believe how how cool the technology was and everything um and there's a uh, tv guide devoted four pages to the story you know tv guide was massive because you would get it sent to your mm-hmm. house and you'd see what was on tv for for the foreseeable future um i remember when my family still got tv guides. yeah i i it's that's that's pretty borderline for me i remember seeing them like tv <laughs> guides like in my grandparents house but it wasn't like something i really yeah grandparents actually was more was more what it was yeah that's yeah. a good point um but uh they failed to mention with the tv guide f- devoted four pages that this new technology that everybody's freaking out about had been pioneered 31 years earlier in film, most prominently inside the gorilla King Kong in 1933. Mm. I mean, this was like a whole production of it, though. You know, like full sets, full full everything. I, I can see the big deal, but yeah, I mean, of course, there's it's not the first time. That, that happens so often, I feel like. Yeah, I, I just like, I love to see King Kong get the props because like that 1933 stop motion <laughs> yeah. King Kong is is like legendary for a reason. Um, it, it was mm-hmm. huge for for film and like having those sense those sort of effects were just like so groundbreaking but let's move into the synopsis here are you ready sure okay sam the snowman narrates the story which takes place in christmas town at the north pole four years before the big snowstorm which almost canceled christmas donner santa's lead reindeer and his wife had a, fa- a new fawn named rudolph they are surprised to see that he has been born with a glowing red nose when Santa arrives, he warns Donner that Rudolph will not make the sleigh team because of his nose. So Donner decides to hide it by covering it with a false black nose so Rudolph will fit in with the other reindeer. Next year, Rudolph goes out for the reindeer games where the new fawns learn to fly and are scouted by Santa for future sleigh duty. Rudolph meets a doe named Clarice who tells him he is cute, making Rudolph fly. While he celebrates with the other bucks, Rudolph's fake nose pops off, causing the other reindeer to mock him and coach Comet to expel him. Rudolph meets and joins Hermie, a misfit elf running running away from Santa's workshop because he wants to be a dentist instead of making toys. They meet Yukon Cornelius, a prospector who has spent his life searching for silver and gold. After escaping the abominable snow monster, they land on the island of misfit toys, where unloved or unwanted toys li- live with their ruler, a winged lion named King Moonracer, who brings the toys to the island until he can find homes and children who will love them. The king allows them to stay one night on the island and asks them to ask Santa to find homes for them. Rudolph leaves on his own, worried that his nose will endanger his friends. Wow, okay, so that is a lot to talk about there. Let's go all the way back to the beginning and the introduction of the biggest asshole in this entire story, Donner. Yeah. What a, what a bastard. <laughs> his own, his, his new son. He immediately is body shaming him mercilessly, telling him to cover his shame. And he's like, yeah, being having self-respect is more important than having comfort. Yeah. And just he's awful. <laughs> I thought that, uh, you know, it wasn't around back then, but I assumed that this was like, this was whoever was involved with the decision making process, the director, whoever it was, saying, like, this is how my dad treated me. You know, this is how dads are. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Maybe they were. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I can see this story as as sort of a, you know, like an allegory for uh, being an outcast in, in or being uh, not fitting into society in many ways, whether that's with your sexuality, with your race, with your gender. Um and when you look at it through those those lights, uh, a lot of these bullying and stuff it, it takes on the like even darker tone. And I think that that's why this story resonates with people too, because I think everybody can feel an outcast at some time or another, um, and mm-hmm. and that's going to be sort of a universal f- thing that people can relate to. And um, Santa's also kind of a fucking asshole. Oh, for sure. Oh, so so Santa is a whole nother thing I want to talk about. This is essentially a feudal 
society where Santa rules with an iron fist, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, he's got this work camp of, of elves who are taught to only make toys and do anything else and you're, you're going to, you know, be ostracized. He has them just like singing carols all year where he like sits on his throne and, and, and tries to judge them on whether or not it's like a, pleases him. He goes around being shitty to them. The reindeer, literally all they do is play sports to train themselves to be his on his sleigh. Like so their whole lives is devoted to his, his service. Um, it's pretty dark when you start to think about it. It's it's dark. He's like, I'm the magic man who delivers presents and you will you will follow my rule. It's crazy. Like he he <laughs> yeah. um, there's all kinds of really like the way that he he's like Donner. He's like, he's bringing shame to your family right now. You better fix this shit. Yeah, yeah. And like, you're like, Jesus, Santa. Yeah, you better hope. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, Santa's a real villain in this. I don't know how you're supposed to like him at all. Uh, the one thing is, I guess, kind of funny is that like Mrs. Claus is trying to fatten him up and he's resisting. He's like super thin. But it also just shows that like the, the whole fat like jolly Santa is all an act that he puts on mm -hmm. for actual Christmas. But like year round, he's not like that. Like yeah. he's thin and harsh. I prefer the uh, I don't know the the traditional animated uh, version. I prefer that version of Santa. That's my honestly, and that's something else I wanted to mention. That that's the my version and my imagination growing. Up. That was my Santa. That Santa in that like yeah. That was my ideal Santa. Like the way that he acted, just like everything about him. I was like, that's <laughs> uh -huh. my Santa. Um, Whereas this one, not my Santa. <laughs> uh, okay, so then uh, we got to talk about this elf foreman who is shitting on Hermie and doesn't want him to be a dentist. And um, it is this like, I feel like it's saying something about labor, right? Like, uh, you know, like he's he's basically oppressive management keeping you in line he he denies him a break until he like fixes this to this toy he's been working on mm -hmm. um i don't know it feels like they're sneaking in some like societal commentary here you know yeah. because i i remember watching this like as i'm watching it not only am i remembering the scenes i'm remembering the messages that i was taking away and how i was like yeah this is bad it's bad to, it's bad to um ostracize Rudolph, but it's also bad to, you know, ostracize this elf for being different. And look at how them and the, these misfit toys, like, they're all the same. They, they might be different in different ways, but they've all been cast out by society, and isn't that terrible? Like, I feel like I was, like, internalizing all these messages, you know, which which I think were important for me. Yeah, I, for sure. I, I think that um, it's also interesting to think about the fact that, like, there needs to be at least one dentist down there. And, like, you would think you'd be like, okay, you can be the <laughs> dentist if you want to be so that we can, like, not Only have... later when he gets a cavity does it become important, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I did read something. It's funny because, like, when I found out we were covering... When we decided we were covering this, all of a sudden I'm seeing all this stuff everywhere. And, in fact, actually, Remy, who's been on the podcast in the past... Um, he, he sent me an article or he, he sent, I'm in like a group chat and he posted this article about Rudolph, not knowing that we're covering it at all. Mm -hmm. And I read through it and, um, it was basically just talking about like a lot of the social, social messaging, um, going on in the story and how it like, it's really dark. Um, one of the things that the author pointed out, and actually I'll, I'll post the, the link to this article in the show notes, but just because I'm referencing it, but they pointed out that her, uh, Hermie, uh, is sort of coded as homosexual in this. Um, and I, I don't know, like, I can't speak to that for certain, but I can see it too, I guess. And so um, it, it, I guess they were theorizing that maybe this was like, a, 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 I don't know, like trying to evoke that, right? Like he's he's different. He doesn't want to go to work. Like he wants to be, he's kind of an intellectual, I guess, wanting to be a dentist. But yeah, I mean, I can see it. What do you think? I don't know. I I had never really thought of it from that angle before, so it's kind of just hitting me right now. But I, I mean, I, th I I can see kind of what you're getting at, but I would need like sort of concrete facts. I'll have to read the article and see like I I can't do it justice. I should have I should have had it in front of me. But um anyway, I'll link it. You we, you, yeah, you know you can be I'll the judge yourself. Give it a read. Um, I do want to talk about Yukon Cornelius, who is probably my favorite character. Yeah. Uh, just for the sh He's pretty fun. sheer like like I, he was not a character that was in any other version, and they brought him in, and I'm like this guy's 
super wild. He's got a gun on his waist and stuff. Like he's wild. never shoots it though. Surprisingly, well, they're getting chased by the the bundle of snowman star. I kept expecting him to draw down on him, but he never does. He said something about gunpowder at one point and i was like oh shit he's gonna shoot this abominable uh, snow monster at one point remember that yeah yeah but he doesn't <laughs> so uh the other thing is the uh aslan king moon racer aslan <laughs> <laughs> i have so many questions <laughs> i'm sure these are addressed in future movies but i'm like who is this who is this aslan like king moon raker is that his name moon racer moon, moon, moon razor um who is he why does he do this yeah is he jesus what's going on <laughs> he's some sort of uh he's another feudal lord but he's just like more exactly is he gonna go to war with santa yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> with the misfit toys he's just saving up he's trying to get an army together but yeah very very weird interesting kind of thing to thread into a children's story about rudolph it doesn't feel like it fits but i love it because it, because of that like that's what i mean about the fantasy yeah. elements like this is so fantastical that i love it Mm -hmm. so we also meet clarice the doe uh who uh actually thought like was going to be worse and like more cringy sort of sexist type stuff and like it's very heteronormative sure but other than that i felt like it was dealt with pretty well like she she accepts him for who he is she tells him that she doesn't mind the nose um and then later uh her and mrs donner head out on their own to go look for him. I wish we'd gotten a little more of that story than we ended up yeah. getting because all that ends up happening is they get captured by the snow, ma snow monster with Donner um, later. And I'm like, oh, so nothing really came of that. I kept expecting them to be the ones to rescue Rudolph, you know, which yeah. would have been cool. I love, I, so this is a moment that I had in this movie. They're like, Donner's like, I'm no, I'm going alone. Because, and then it was like the, the narrator was like, because that's what men do or something like that. And I was like, what the fuck is yeah. going? And this is so like old school, of course, like dated. And then they were like, and then they were like, and then uh, Clarice and, and Rudolph's mother, they go off on their own. And I was like, OK, I was like, I see you like a sl yeah. like kind it's, of, you know, giving I mean? them like this, some agency. This, it continues to surprise, yeah. you know, I was like, surprised. It's, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I like I, I continue to like I think this movie has good messaging, you know, like as much as like, you know, you can criticize the ending for like, you know, Rudolph ultimately conforms. But like so much of it is presented as being bad. Right. Like it's like, uh, you know, none of the, none of these forces like Santa and, and Donner are the villains of this story for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I just thought of something. So, I mean, we should talk about the stop motion a little bit. Like, what what did you think? How did you think it held up? Because I have a couple of anecdotal things I want to talk about with it. I think it held up pretty well. Yeah. It looked pretty good. Um, it's not as detailed as stuff, other things we've seen. Like, we covered Coraline, which is, you know, absolutely incredible. Um, but for early ver an early version of this kind of thing, I thought it mostly looked great. And, um, you know, especially when you have, like, all these mountains and you have at one point it looks like there's, like, the northern lights they're evoking the right stuff to make you feel like you're in the North Pole. Yeah. So I thought it was cool. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And, and it was kind of getting me down this path of like, why is this so influential? And, and I think some of the stop motion stuff is just like all that you need for stop motion is some sort of malleable thing, whether it's clay, whatever it is. And like a kid can do it. You know what I mean? I think that's something that you can you mm -hmm. don't you might not be able to get people together, actors and stuff to shoot scenes, but you can do stop motion in your bedroom you know like and i think a lot of sure. people fell in love with it because of that reason um and you know a character i hadn't thought of in forever that all of this stop motion stuff was bringing to mind when's the last time you heard anyone talk about gumby uh yeah i don't know i, I remember, you remember gumby, gumby though right like i i was like holy shit sure, gumby yeah. like that that's like a thing from like i think gumby had like a resurgence in my child like like when we were very young or when i was young but mm -hmm. but it's originally from like really long time ago um anyway just just stuff i was thinking about but with this um with this i wanted to bring up the movie elf because elf is very clearly connected to this movie um the costuming in the movie really? elf like john favreau's elf and from 2003 with will ferrell um the costuming i haven't seen it in the set design everything you haven't seen it oh wow no, i haven't seen it <laughs> that's that's wild man you should check that out i, I think you'd i think you'd enjoy it yeah i'm not the biggest is. will ferrell fan like i often don't 
he doesn't draw me to movies the way that he seems to draw it's not, other people it, to. I, I don't think that you can really fit it in the same categories as other stuff too. It, but there's some Will Ferrell, Will Ferrell stuff. But but I would say like you'd be surprised. Um, but anyway, the costuming mm. in the North Pole is is like basically they cloned this movie and then they did all the costuming, all the set design, and there are actually stop motion animation scenes that are that are referencing the Rankin Bass like Christmas movies in elf um so that's cool like legacy that's that's continued with the movie elf there um which yeah that's cool it, it's pretty awesome and then um you have been watching community which i've been very like really excited about and uh, you know abed's uncontrollable mm-hmm. christmas episode that you just watched recently you told me is clearly influenced yeah. by this you know these these rankin bass yeah chil- the, uh christmas stories absolutely yeah it's a it's a definite reference to this that was, that was a fun episode for yeah. sure a great show. I any I just like to the I'm taking the opportunity because we can we can connect it to the community. I I really enjoy that show and I, I highly recommend it just because it's <laughs> it's it's just clever uh-huh. fun writing. So yeah, I'm having fun with it. We got to talk about the Island of Misfit Toys though because when I whenever I hear the name the Island of Misfit Toys, I'm like that sounds fucking rad. Yeah, like that's where I want to live. Yeah, right. Like it sounds like like you know like that it doesn't sound like somewhere I'd want to leave. Now there it's shown to not be very hospitable. It's just kind of a bunch of toys laying out in a tundra, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, with a, with a with a fortress of solitude overlooking it that Aslan lives in, a flying Aslan. Yeah. Um. But uh, but I mean otherwise I, I thought it was pretty cool and like I, I liked the misfit toys. Um. I don't know why there's a water pistol that shoots jelly. Um. Right. That was weird. Yeah. Um. <laughs> there's some when they do the song listing all the different toys. There's some. There's like some a interesting train with uh, a caboose. Oddballs in there. Yeah. There's a train with a caboose that has square with wheels. Full, square wheels. Yeah. We never find out why the doll is there. She's never she's never described and she looks normal yeah. to me. So. I mean, what's wrong with a polka Mystery? dot elephant anyway? Like that's not really a yeah, problem. You, who wants a spotted elephant, James? Yeah, that's pretty. I don't know. <laughs> weird that people wouldn't want well of them. course like that was me as a kid too i was like look at all these toys these toys are great i want to play with all of them right you know and, and so they're doing a good job of like making us connect with these these misfits yeah um i have a i'm like i'm that kid i'm, I'm the kid who will love you <laughs> bring it bring that to me uh hmm. in the original tv version of the show rudolph Hermie the Elf and Yukon Cornelius visit the island of misfit toys and promise to help them. But the misfits are never mentioned again. After it was shown, the producers were inundated with letters from children complaining that nothing had been done to help the misfit toys. In response, Rankin Bass produced a new short scene at the end of the show in which Santa and his reindeer, led by Rudolph, land on the island and pick up all the toys to find homes for them. The scene became a part of the standard version of the show run during the holidays. Okay, I, and I guess because we're talking about it, I got to mention they murder the fucking bird at the end of the se- at the end of this movie. <laughs> I, know, I know. Yeah. Did you notice that they murder the they bird didn't give toy? It an umbrella. They didn't give him an umbrella. They look at him. They're like, "You'll be fine." And they kick him out of the sleigh. Yeah. <laughs> it's because he I, and like he his whole thing is he can't fly. Yeah, it's so crazy. <laughs> oh man, maybe they're trying to say like he figured it uh, out, but then again, I don't know. Maybe not. Hmm. Mm, hopefully let's hope he can glide there was also the moment that uh, well let's let's get to the rest of the synopsis because I'm, I'm talking i'm about to talk about something that's beyond where we're at yeah, so yeah three years pass and rudolph is now a young stag he returns home to find that his parents and clarice have gone looking for him which you know three years is a long time for them to be out looking for him uh he sets out to locate them and finds them cornered in a cave by the abominable rudolph tries to save clarice but the monster hits him in the head with a stalactite Hermie and Yukon show up. Hermie lures the monster out of the cave by imitating the sound of a pig and pulls out his his teeth after Yukon knocks him out. Yukon then drives the toothless monster back over a cliff and falls with it. Rudolph, Hermie, Clarice, and the Donners return home where everyone apologizes to them. Santa promises Rudolph that he will find homes for the misfit toys. The head elf tells Hermie that he can open his own dentist's office a week after Christmas, and Donner apologizes for being hard on Rudolph. Yukon returns with a tamed abominable, now trained to trim a Christmas tree, explaining that the monster's bouncing ability saved their lives. Christmas Eve comes, and yeah. while everybody is celebrating, Santa announces that a big snowstorm is approaching, forcing him to cancel Christmas. Blinded by Rudolph's bright nose, he changes his mind and asks Rudolph to lead the sleigh. Rudolph accepts, and their first stop is the Island of Misfit Toys, which they deliver by parachute. Santa wishes everyone a Merry Christmas as Rudolph and his team fly into the night. A- aka an umbrella that, that they would float down on but yeah. yeah i was identifying a certain story structure here 
Can you name it? Is it the one that we've touched on many times? Hero's Journey. The Hero's Journey. Right? Yeah, like the hero we returns. Rudolph, changed. Hero he goes off on an adventure and he returns home changed. Um, I do think it's a little different though because he is he ends up being rescued by his friends in a cool way, right? Like it isn't Rudolph who's able to save the day. It's actually Yukon and um, Hermie who save the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, which i I don't know obviously rudolph does save the day for christmas so i guess he gets his moment a little bit later yeah it's Um, classic story structure it works it works for a reason yeah i mean and and like i feel like some of the time people would do it without even understanding or realizing that they're doing it you know yeah just because a lot of stories i think it's just natural right when you're trying to like come up with a story you're like thinking about it and like those are the beats that will naturally fall into place because that's Mm -hmm. what you're used to yeah well what do you think of the battle i felt like rudolph potentially died when he got hit with that stalactite from like a 10 like 20 30 foot monster whatever however big he's supposed to be <laughs> yeah, man, he's he's gone up a bunch of levels and he has a lot of hit points at this point yeah but he's true. all right he got the, he's got the <laughs> horns too so he's trying to hit the stalactite with the horns yeah it's pretty brutal though what they do to this snowman they rip yeah. out all his teeth and then force him to conform by bringing him in at the end, now he's toothless and he's able to light up Christmas trees and he can integrate into society. Yeah, I love that uh, Yukon, it's like, it's like, yeah, and I taught him this. And like you're like, you taught yeah. him to put the star on the tree? Uh, yeah. Unclear. <laughs> I don't know. Yukon's a fun character. His, he's got this like sleigh full of dogs and they're all like, if you notice, like none of them are actual like huskies, yeah. like the kind of sled yeah. dogs you'd imagine. There's like a Dalmatian and a um it's like one of those wiener dogs like it's like a, just random dogs yeah and then it, it's kind of an ongoing joke that he's like keeps telling them to mush but they don't know how or they don't care and so then he'll have to drag the sleigh himself another so, moment yeah funny. another moment where i thought that we were going to see something i thought he was going to like whip the dogs or something the first time he was like come on mush and he yeah. gets off and he walks over it looks like he's going to whip them for a second and then he's like like this and he starts pulling it and they all hop on the sled i was like that's just like fun they, they writing there like good ride. for them <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, uh, again, the props like this this special holds up surprisingly well. I think it's good. It's like it's the kind of thing you probably want to have a conversation with your kid after you watch it because there is a lot of like heavy stuff in here, and I feel like it would be possible to read this the wrong way. But yeah, I, I think it holds up pretty well, yeah. especially for something from the '60s. There was the moment when you, I thought we were going to deal with loss too. I thought we were going to because I thought Yukon was going to stay dead for a second and i was like oh wow that's like that's i knew he heavy. wasn't gonna die come on yeah i mean ultimately i feel like i knew but i was like that'd be pretty heavy to like and ballsy to be like this is it would you be know, pretty heavy kill children need to learn that sometimes you know what i mean mufasa was that for me in lion yeah. king like like kids learn that young bambi's bambi's mom bambi yeah that was that yeah. was it for me yeah i mean it, kids learn it in some kids movies and like you know i thought this might have been one of them but it wasn't um and for a second yeah. i was like damn they killed you yeah it'd be tough for a christmas movie yeah, so I mean, it's been fun covering Rudolph. I have one other thing that I just wanted to talk about in terms of the production. So the Santa puppet is eight inches tall. Young Rudolph is four inches tall, and his nose really does light up. The puppet that they created, um, the the puppets are made from wood, wire, and fabric, and are quite fragile. Uh, the Japanese company that handled animation made several copies of each puppet since they didn't last long under the constant handling of stop motion posing. They looked tactile, like you could tell the texture of them. That was one of the things I liked. Like you could tell it, they, uh, the Rudolph, like and the reindeer, they looked soft, which was kind of cool, right? Like um, it, it, it's reminiscent of of a doll. Um, so I, I think it works on that level too. I don't know for sure, but it feels like it'd be it'd be kind of unique. It was the kind of the first time they were doing more of the felt look. I don't know. Yeah, it has a very unique look to yeah. it, at, le- at the very least. Um, but I also did. Yeah. Well, well, voice acted too. I thought. Um, yeah. A lot of the a lot of the characters were. I mean, Yukon was fun. He was engaging. You know, Rudolph did a good job being cute when he was when he had his nose covering on and he was doing that sort of like like squeezing his nose together. It sounded like voice version of his voice. Like I thought that was cute. Yeah. Like I, I thought it, it all worked. It definitely worked. Like, I, and I think that's why it, there, all these things come together to form something that I think is, you know, stood the test of time for a reason. And, and it, it's crazy. Cause like, you know, as a kid, we could have looked at this and been like, this is, this looks old or this feels old, but it didn't for mm-hmm. what, you know, for, for reasons that I think like it's of a high quality, it's got, it's catchy, it's interesting. It gets your attention. Um, and I think it's going to be like that for a lot of generations to come. So there's one other video I'm going to shout out. Um, it is Wisecrack 
uh, just recently put out a video about Rudolph. Have you ever, I don't know if you're familiar with that channel. Um, they do like the philosophy breaks down, like the philosophy yeah. behind such and such. And they did the philosophy of Rudolph. Yeah, they do those those comedy ones with the alien, like analyzing uh, film. Like our, they'll be like, we've, we've uncovered this DVD. And then they'll like completely analyze it incorrectly. It's like this. Sh- oh, interesting. It's a funny little I've bit. They do. I'll have to check that out. But um, they did the Rudolph one in particular is cool to watch. It they talk a lot about biopolitics, and um, I was touching on some of the the points that they made. Um, I had already been going that way, but um, they they helped me sort of solidify some of these thoughts. Um, but even more in that route, if you want to go down that path even more, that's like the main focus of the video. Um, very cool. I'll link it in the show notes. Cool. Yeah, and the last note that I have that I thought was interesting because we, we talked about the puppets, copies of both the Santa and Rudolph puppets were found in storage in the attic of a woman that used to work for Rankin Bass. The puppets were in rather poor condition. Santa was missing his eyebrows and half his mustache along with his legs being broken. Rudolph's iconic nose was missing and replaced with red wax, but amazingly survived being stored in a hot attic since the late 1960s. They have since been restored by screen novelties to their former glory and now travel the country to various trade shows and conventions. Wow, that's fun. Yeah. I'd love to see them. That'd be cool. Well, before we go, we should take our last vote of the year on which is the best version of Rudolph. And uh, I want to have all versions on the table that we've covered today. The poem, the song, the animated short, and the stop motion feature. Uh, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, it's it's um, there's a couple of reasons why I'm going to pick what I pick, but I'll start going through the the poem, I think, has a legacy for a reason. We talked about how it's like it's sort of playing. It's fun. Um, it's got enough of like a it's accessible kind of. And I think mm-hmm. that that's part of the success of it. And then obviously it's continued to become this like huge legacy for Rudolph and then um same with the song I mean the song is like played every year for sure yeah iconic and then for me I'm kind of biased and the 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 short film really uh I love that short film like I don't know what it is it's it's uh short and sweet and I think it gets the message across um and I really like the animation and and like I said that's my Santa but I'm going to choose the stop motion version uh, as my favorite um, for a lot of the reasons that we talked about. I liked the liberties that they took. Like I liked the fantasy elements that were added, the the media, how important it is for the medium of animation, stop motion animation, and then how Rankin Bass would continue on to do other, you know, traditionally animated features and, and um, the legacy of animation uh, that I think stems from this. And, and, you know, this being on TV for as long as it was, it's such a, I think this is what people think of when they think of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So I'm taking the, the yeah. stop motion film. Uh, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I, I, the stop motion's great. You know, we talked about the many reasons why the fantasy elements are really cool. Um, but I don't know, I'm having a wild hair today and I think I'm going to go against the grain and I want to give it to the original poem. Um, mm-hmm. I think there, after learning about the story behind it and the guy's wife dying during it and Mm. him being this like copy editor who, you know, wanted to be a novelist, but instead having to make ends meet with this poor poor paying drop job. Then he comes up with this iconic Christmas story that will stand the test of time and has already outlived him and will continue to outlive, you know, all of us. And he did this, you know, not, the traditional route at all just you know because his boss asked him to do it for for this you know marketing campaign i don't know there's something yeah. just cool about that and then like uh, the the story itself has this tinge of sadness and loneliness um that just feels pure to me and as much as i enjoy that stop motion feature um yeah i'm gonna give it to the original so yeah shout out. It, this i wanted to say this earlier in the episode but his story somewhat for me brings to mind stan lee and sort of his his coming into comics and then like creating what marvel would become and, and the stories of how like spider-man was created um and how spider-man has become such an icon in like pop culture uh it kind of mirrors it because it is sort of like you know you're having to deal with your bosses and it's sort of like not not going to be seen as this like it was always going to be just like a throwaway thing for kids. But like, I think Rudolph, he, he went out of his way to elevate Rudolph in the same way that I think Stan Lee sort of wanted to 
to he didn't want to just like create throwaway content i think they they like did something that that you know struck a chord and there's a reason why they have legacies that continue on for so long all right so that's going to be it for our holiday special happy holidays to everybody merry christmas if that's what you celebrate um i want to shout out one of our newest patrons dana b recently signed up so thank you for joining uh speaking of patreon we tried something really unusual and different uh, this month we put out a commentary track uh we took a vote and we ended up going with die hard the original die hard um we recorded that last night it was very unusual for us um don't know if we're gonna do it again (laughs) um we're gonna be really curious to know what people think of it if it sounds like something you might be interested in you know check out our patreon and uh you know give it a listen and comment and let us know what you thought yeah it was a lot of fun so we hope you guys have as much fun as we did um it was it was an experience for sure something different so check it out (laughs) very different um if you wanted to stay in touch with us find us on social media we're at ink to film on facebook twitter and instagram uh we'd love to connect with you talk with you join our council of inklings on facebook that's where we had the poll up uh, about the patreon episode all that good stuff yeah and wherever you're listening to this podcast we would really appreciate if you wanted to help support us uh you know a like comment subscribe on youtube uh if you're on itunes spotify wherever you're at i know spotify you can't really do that much but subscribe for sure um and and make sure to to, wherever you can uh get the word out we would really appreciate that yeah rating and review if it's possible you know that still helps i know it sounds old-fashioned but it really does help Uh, i think people look at them they look for that for them for like guidance of like what to listen to so very helpful All right, so that's going to be it. We will be back for one final episode in 2020. That is our last looks recap episode. Those are usually a lot of fun. Uh, Hopefully you will join us for that. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.